Smart. Act natural. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to our Directing Praxis panel here at Pangea World Theater as part of the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation, which is a partnership with Art to Action. We're very excited to be here in the Twin Cities with this amazing panel of folks. Um, my name is Andrea Saf. I'm the Artistic Director of Art to Action, Inc., and always very, very happy to be in this wonderful theater town of Minneapolis with all these wonderful people both up here on the panel and that uh, folks can't see back home. We wanna give a big thank you to HowlRound for live streaming this event and uh, to all of you for being here and part of this conversation. Um, so uh, before I do a little framing of the conversation that we're going to be having around directing, uh, I've asked ev all of the panelists to introduce themselves, um, the organization that they work with or affiliated with if they currently have one or where they're based, and a little bit about the context um, that you're all working in um, so that we know how to uh, how to hear uh, the conversation that follows with your context in mind. Um, so it's a great honor to first uh, pass the mic to Lou Bellamy. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lou Bellamy. Uh, I am founder and artistic director emeritus of Penumbra Theater Company in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, our uh, reason for being, if you will, is, is to explore the human condition using the African American culture and lens as a context through which to understand humanness. The belief, of course, is that uh, anyone who uh, is willing to look at themselves and their own culture will always come to the same universal, but we're not used to seeing it through that African-American lens. And when I began that theater 40-some uh, years ago, there was no one telling those kinds of stories in Minnesota. So we elected to, uh, to have provide sort of a safe space where those stories should, could be explored. We view ourselves as a uh, professional theater inside of a community. And that is a very special kind of charge because you are then responsible to that community. And you may not always want to hear what them folks want to tell you, <laughs> but they're there and, and we invite them to be part of it, help define it. Indeed. It isn't even, it can't happen without them. Uh, all the work that I do, that I direct, <clears throat> are directed and, and presented as though there are no one but African Americans in the house. These, I, I don't draw dotted lines for those of you who don't get it, you know. Uh, you have to come along for the trip just like we've all, in this dominant society, been placed in situations where we're unfamiliar with the language, with the mores, with the, the, uh, the uh, uh, tropes that, that they're using. So we have to lean into them. Well, I wanted a place where it was safe to push that language, that culture, that experience, as far as we could push it in all directions. and. Uh, it's still there, the space. My daughter's holding the rubber band open, letting people <laughs> in, but it's it's still there, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Diane Roberts, and um, I am the only Canadian on this panel, and so uh, I guess the context I'm somewhat representing is the Canadian context. <laughs> Excuse me, where racism, see, I, I choked on this. <laughs> where racism doesn't exist. Everybody's really nice, and we all travel with the Mounties. 
Um, no, it's, it's, uh, I mean, the, the context is very similar, but quite different. And um, it's, in with, it's within this context where this denial of racism or this sort of um, sorry um, um, lack of acknowledgement of racism um, and colonization and the roots of colonization um, uh, sort of drew me to the process that uh, I'm representing or the project I'm representing. I've run a number of different companies in three different cities in, in across Canada. And right now, um, I developed a process called the Arrivals Legacy Project, which um, embraces the idea of um, belonging or the need to belong, the desire to belong, embraces that as a, a, an aesthetic process, as, as not a, a lack of, like I, I don't belong, but, but this sense of belonging or this reaching to belong is actually an aesthetic practice, can be an aesthetic practice. So um, in the Arrivals Legacy Project, we draw on ancestry um, as a, as a jump-off point for artistic creation. Um, my name is Malik Najjar. I'm an associate professor of theater arts at the University of Oregon. And uh, my focus is on Arab American, Middle Eastern American, and Middle Eastern theater. Um, I am a child of immigrants. I'm married to an immigrant and uh, nobody's going back to a crime-ridden, broken place. They're staying here, and they'll feel free to continue to critique our nation in order to make it better, because we love this country. Um, my work focuses on the, the plays written by Arabs and Arab Americans and Middle Easterners who come from the diaspora and are writing about very difficult lives that they may have conflicts and wars. Um, well, the Middle East, what we generally call you know, the Middle Eastern countries. And um, I teach classes in that vein as well. I've, I've created an Arab American theater class, Middle Eastern theater class, um, classes about uh, artists who are exiled from their countries from all over the world. So I feel that my, I'm a scholar practitioner. So I direct plays and I also teach plays. history, so I find it to be my job to uh, unearth that history and to bring it back into the light and to make others aware of it, because um, too often I think that the dominant thought is that these people arrived recently and, you know, uh, some sort of problematic uh, portion of our Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Diane Rodriguez, and I come from the land of California. Uh, my mother and father were both farm workers. My mother worked the migrant trail from uh, Indio, California, all the way to Gilroy, California. They, put, they picked garlic and celery and strawberries and apricots. I joined and I joined in the mid and I learned a theory from Luis Valdez. Uh, I studied there for ten for eleven years at a moment when position in the United States. Uh, there I learned uh, what of the theory of in la quiche was. Does anyone know what that is? Tu eres mi otro yo. 
you are my other self. And it's uh, symbolic, it's symbolized by uh, a I have always been at the center of my community and my practice always they have supported me uh, they are my another theater company called Latin's Anonymous. Uh, and we were funny people. <laughs> we made fun of everything. And there were two ladies in it, which was unusual when we started. And then I entered a time when I worked with Luis Alfaro, and we developed Latino uh, uh, plays and Latino audiences. And that ended with a new artistic director. I worked for the, you know, one of the founding uh, godfathers of the regional theater, Gordon Davidson, and then I transitioned into working for Michael Ritchie. And uh, I was itching because plays for me were starting not to service my community as much as I thought. And I really wanted to commission and develop the work of ensemble theaters, both here in the United States and internationally. And I wanted to work with people where the sole vision was not the sole vision of a playwright, but it was people that were involved in a rehearsal room and making a work together. So uh, I, was, I received a large funding and for the next 10 years, that changed my life. Traveled all over the world, went to various festivals across the country, and in New like what I was doing no longer serviced my community or me as an artist. A new chapter. And being here at the Institute has launched I am it. 
feel that was the springboard that I know I know that was a springboard that created Kahalao Hanakeaka, which is the Hawaiian medium theater troupe that I continue to serve as artistic director for. Um, I'm also associated with the University of Hawaii at Manoa uh, in the Department of Theater and Dance. I um, run the, the Hawaiian theater program. We're a brand new program. I, I think 2014 we got approval to actually create the program, so we're quite new. We've had our inaugural production. I've had the inaugural MFA uh, candidate come through and graduate and do her production. Um, so we have one MFA in Hawaiian theater rolling in the earth now. Yeah. Um, and we have two more in the program right now. Uh, I also have the opportunity to work with our playwriting students in our, in our program. And so through the university and through community effort, we are just trying to create space for our voices to be heard because they're very much underrepresented. Okay, mahalo. So first, uh, a, a couple of acknowledgements. Um, thank you, Haleopua, for acknowledging uh, where we are, which I would also like to join you in acknowledging that we are on the ancestral lands of the Dakota people and the Ojibwe people. And thank you for acknowledging that in your opening. And uh, at Pangea World Theater and Art Action, we have a commitment to um, always um, stating that because we should never, ever forget. Um, I also want to acknowledge for those who are following by via live stream that we've been having a little bit of sound uh, challenges, so please stay with us. Um, I think it's uh, back on now, but um, if, if you're out there, yeah, if you're out there, hang in there. And for uh, the folks here uh, live, um, just know that the mic is going um, directly through the live stream, so if you want to make a lot of, if you want to make noise to support what you hear here, you've got to make a lot of noise uh, for the folks out there on the live stream to hear you, so uh, don't hold back <laughs> if you hear something that you want to support. So um, thank you for those beautiful introductions. Um, I want to do a little framing that we all agreed upon about this panel, which is um, and it was, it's already been acknowledged in some of the um, introductions around context. Um, but we all know as people of color that we are um, constantly in a conversation and in a struggle for um, cultural equity, racial equity, gender equity in our field, uh, in the United States in particular, in the theater field, specifically in the arts field and culture field, field of arts and culture more generally. Um, and we are um, often on panels in national forums where uh, we need to talk about that and we need to talk about the lack of resources for the work or more specifically the in inequitable distribution of the resources that exist in the field. And that that is a very important conversation. And also, right now, we really want to talk about our art making. Because uh, we don't often get the opportunity to get together and just talk about what we're excited about, what we're inspired by, what we're passionate about, what our aesthetics are, how we make our work. Um, and so that's what this panel is going to focus on. Uh, and we all wanted to acknowledge that that lives constantly with the other conversation of equity. And uh, because we've chosen to take this time to talk about aesthetics, uh, we also know that we are continuing that conversation out there in the world and must. And um, need our witnesses and listeners and viewers to continue that equity and justice conversation with us. So having said that, I'm going to pass the mic again to talk about right now in your work, what are you excited about or inspired by or passionate about in your aesthetics or creative process right now? Well, uh, I know there's so much to say, yeah. um, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm loath to, to, I'm afraid that I may miss something. The important thing is, is that, for me at least, is that it starts with a cultural expression of who I am, 
we do ensemble theater. That's what I do. A lot of people talk about ensemble theater. I, I think I really do it. Um, and, and, and so quite often, I, now I direct at major regionals, but I will go in and do a piece in this sort of respectful ensemble way, and people will say, you know, I thought I knew that play. I've seen that play, I've seen that play five, six, seven times, but I've never really seen it because I ask the people to talk. One of the things, I, I was raised by women, really strong women. And, uh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> no, they, they, they gave me a, a power and made me ask a question about the work that I do, about what are the women doing? And when you ask that question, these texts live in a different kind of way. They become holistic. They, there's another answer to a seemingly simple question when you ask that. And uh, it, it's stood me in good stead. I, <clears throat> I do the work, as I said, for African Americans. That doesn't mean that there isn't a, a worth in it for other folks. Um, I, am I talking? Is it, okay, I can keep on. Uh, um, I am, the community that I create work for is used to things being taken away from them. Um, anything that's good that rises to the top is sort of creamed off and taken for the larger society. Marx talked about it when he talked about uh, objects picking up monetary worth as they move toward the periphery of the culture. Well, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of that all the time. I remember coming off stage a while ago, I don't act anymore, but um, coming off stage and this old lady that I knew from the hood uh, said to me, you know, she looked at me and she said, you know, you're good. And I started, you know, the old actor kicking me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, ma'am, thank you. And she said, no. And, I, and when her voice went there, I knew this woman, I gotta look up now. No, no, you're really good. And I looked her in the eye and said, thank you. And her next question was so telling for me. She said, why are you still here? Why are you still amongst us? Why are you in the community? As good as you are. It just broke, well, I'm gonna cry right now, it just broke my heart, you know? For me, she's so used to that, that cycle. The good thing is, is that we've got a, an amount of creativity and a place to go to get some more, to keep on keeping on, you know, that we, we, we've, we've got that. But that's the sort of the context out of which that word, the urge for the work happens. It's been codified in, in large places by people who have come out of the company. August Wilson, you know, for instance. I mean, we've done a lot of that stuff. But it all comes from that urge of creating that work of, by, for. That's an easy one. The harder one is near. Yeah. Near. Yeah. And we're still doing it. Yeah. Woo! Um, I think for me, what excites me, or maybe it's more a question. There's a question that um, continually goes through my head uh, as I approach um, new work. And uh, it's this idea of how do we embody the stories we create and create the stories we embody. So there's this idea um, that's a, a fundamental in the Arrivals Legacy Project that um, there are stories in our bodies that are buried in our blood and our bones. And that if we can learn how to listen to those stories, how to draw on those stories through breath, through our craft, through our feet, 
firmly on the earth. I talk about these little mouths on the bottoms of our feet that breathe the earth or kiss, kiss and lick and suck the juices from the earth and that there's a response between ourselves and, and the ein, Aina, yes? And, um, and, and then also between us, how do we um, embody the stories we create and create the stories we embody in relationship, in relationship to each other? What, I, what excites me now is that it's actually happening. It's happening in this environment um, this environment is a dream that I've had um, since I, I stepped into the audition room in theater school way back when. <laughs> you know, they asked me, so what is your vision for theater? And I said, I want to have an international, intercultural group of artists that I collaborate with. And I didn't even know what I was talking about then. And to be able to experience that here, um, and to be able to make that a mission in my work is a blessing, really is a blessing. So there's this idea of drawing on these memories in our bodies and the breath of that. And just that moment, that, just that moment of sitting in that, sitting in that possibility of, where, of the memories living, flowing through me and being able to draw on that. And then being able to sit across from somebody who's also drawing. And then I imagine that my ancestor and your ancestor are sitting across from each other. And then the ancestors of this land are sitting across from each other witnessing the relationship building that's happening. So it's very, it's, it, it, it's cyclical, it's multi-directional, and there's so many possibilities. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be there. You know, there's no reason. I think anything else for me is waste of time, a waste of time, you know? So that's, yeah, that's what excites me right now. Well, your question troubles me because I, I can't say my work excites me in a, in a sort of like, oh, how joyous. Um, because a lot of the work I do and focus on is the work of refugees and people coming from war-torn places, um, whether it's Tahrir Square during the uprising, whether it's the Iraq War, whether it's the Lebanese diaspora that survived the Civil War, whether it goes on and on and on. And that, that's the work that I feel compelled to. My parents were survivors of, this, of the various civil wars in Lebanon, my wife barely survived the civil war in Lebanon. She almost was killed uh, in a bombing. So I, uh, I look at the, the people coming from that area and I feel that their stories have to be told. Yes. Like that for me is so important. I feel that, uh, that we, there, there are all these people walking around us in such pain. And not just from the Middle Eastern community. I'm not going to pretend it's only there, it's everywhere. But you know, if we have a, an opportunity to give those people voice, you know, that's, incredible and and so you know when I think about the Syrian refugees when I think about what's happening every day and then I think about the fact that new wars are being concocted I just it it pains me to the nth degree and I, I guess I'm carrying some sort of post trauma around you know I guess that's what it is but that drives me to tell those stories and and when I do a play like Scorched or on some deep by Westy Moir I don't know if you've seen it but I directed that play and I had some of our community members come to see it that were Iranian, Lebanese, Palestinian, and they just said, you took me back to the war. And I first felt guilty. I was like, oh my God, I'm re-traumatizing re these people. And then they said, but I felt like the ending was so healing and I needed that, you know? So for me, that was it. That was, I said, that's what I need to be doing. So um, yeah, I, I, I can't say it excites me, but it drives me. And it makes me want to keep telling these stories, publishing these plays, getting these writers out there, because we need to get these, these people's stories out into the consciousness. So. Um, you know how uh, people love Shakespeare? <laughs> and uh, artists always want to direct it, or they want to act it. 
and uh, and it's they're kind of in to uh, a kind of mainstream um, positioning. And um, I've admitted many times in public, I just don't like Shakespeare. I don't get it. It's not part of my culture. And now, if someone invited me to direct it, I would, I would do it because I want to get inside it. But generally, I find it the epitome of colonizing our communities. And so when I hear about uh, a big theater trying to do an outdoor summer fete and they're centralizing their programming on doing Shakespeare, I'm like, wow, man, I reject it. <laughs> and so uh, a few years ago, I convinced my theater to reach back and go back to San Juan Bautista, where the Teatro Campesino lays and lives and thrives and to do a version of the Bobo Vu, the creation myth. Hey. Part one. Yeah. <laughs> and we did it with a community from Boyle Heights. And we had uh, outdoor performances in the park, Grand Street Park, right by our theater. And we had musicians of every color in the show. And we used, basically used the community of Boyle Heights to do it. And it was huge and it was epic and it was yes. exciting and and there was movement everything that we've been talking about here and after it was over i you know after it was over i thought well, why why don't we widen the circle why don't we bring in the chinese community because my god there were these huge uh, uh puppets that were serpents and it, 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 it emanates from that culture there was movement that, that was, and drumming that was African. And, and there was this huge cultural fusion and there was a circle that was being created that I thought all of us in our communities could benefit from. And the next time I do something like that, an outdoor show in which I figure how to monetize it, <laughs> because that's really, uh, how we get our work out is figuring out how to monetize it and make money on something that we find uh, essential to our to our communities, uh, and and how we can lead. If like this is an alternative to Shakespeare, I understand how everyone wants to embrace Shakespeare. It's part of a, a cultural a cultural a, a, a culture. But, but there are alternatives, and I want to offer an alternative uh, that is based in the new world, right? That is based on our own myths that we all understand and that, and that everyone shares in. I want to lead in that, right, through my aesthetic. So, um, and include everyone that lives in my community in that work share my work with them, my community, and my stories with them, and have them be in it. So, so what excites me? Um, old newspaper archives excite me from the 1830s. <laughs> you know, right, uh, right into the 1940s. But all these Hawaiian language newspapers really excite me because I feel like there are so many mo'olelo, so many stories that have not yet been told, yeah? If you go to the library, there's tons of Shakespeare. There's tons of plays written by white, predominantly men. Um, they're okay, we don't have to do their plays. We don't have to tell their stories, yeah? They're on the shelf already, right? Our stories need to be told. So that excites me to have the opportunity to tell those stories, to create those stories, and kind of repurpose them for today. Yeah. That, that really excites me. The thing that inspires me is all of our keiki olelo Hawaii, all of, all of our young children who are speaking the language. That is what inspires me. And I think when I started to have children, it, it made me more conscious of the need for having theater, for having television, for having film, for, for even having books in the language. So that has been a driving force for me. 
Um, and something that Mr. Lu said really stuck with me, uh, and I just want to get it out there about being asked, why are you still here? For many years, people have asked me, why don't you go to America? Why don't you go to New York? Why don't you go? It, that's not my kuleana. That's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to stay home and tell our stories to our people and be able to articulate and inspire and lift up. And that's why, I mean, even though it, it's wonderful to go national, if you believe in the whole America thing, right? Because <laughs> we kind of have issues with America. <laughs> we do. <laughs> you know, we still feel we're uh, illegally occupied. So, um, you know, it's a wonderful thing to explore that. And uh, I'm very grateful to be here and to make these connections. Um, this is truthfully only the second time I've come to America, the continental US, for anything theater related. I've been here for weddings or, you know, whatever. My sister had a crazy idea of getting married in Las Vegas. Um, and, and that took us to Vegas for the first time. That was exciting and wonderful. Um, but, but truly to be involved in, in uh, any kind of gathering to do with theater, this is the second time and I'm very grateful. Both times have been wonderful. I've met amazing artists and people who continue to inspire. So yeah, those are my two little things. Mahalo. Oh, there's so much already I want to talk about. Um, and, we, <laughs> and, we, and we also, we made a little outline, but I'm just gonna um, continue offering prompts, but also encourage the panel to like, go anywhere that you're passionate about in the conversation, because ideally, we want it to be a conversation. Um, and at some point, we'll also uh, maybe receive some questions or provocations uh, from the folks who are here with us live. Um, but one thing uh, we did want to address is that uh, the name of this panel, and kind of unpack it a little bit so that uh, people maybe know how to enter uh, the conversation. Um, we called it Directing Praxis, and I think honestly when, um, you know, Mina and Dipankar at Pangea and I were like, what do we call this panel, and we were trying to, like, figure it out, we, we just thought it, maybe we just thought it sounded cool, but for <laughs> really, <laughs> like, this call it Directing Praxis. And then, uh, and then we had to really think about, well, what are we trying to get at with that word, but by using that word? which is a word that might alienate some of the communities we're here representing or talking about or working with, right? Um, so I'm, I'm like that dictionary geek that likes to go look everything up. And uh, I, so I was like, well, let's really look at what is the difference between praxis, praxis and practice. And that practice is, um, is defined as when you repeat something and repeat something and repeat something to improve your skill and get better at it, like rehearsal. And praxis is about the application of what you have learned through that repetition. And, and what, in other words, what we want the work to then go out and do in the world. Um, and I also, uh, because I, I'm a little bit of a theory geek, um, know that there's lots of conversations about this or about what we mean by praxis and like on the one hand it might be about that relationship between theory and practice and, and what I'm interested in our work is um, how does our practice embody the theories that it's based on no matter whether those theories come from the academy or from books or philosophy or lived uh, theories of survival from our communities, um, but how does our practice actually embody uh, the theory that informs it? And the other part of that piece is um, what, how does it relate to action or activism or what we want the work to do in the world, the impact of it, the why, the um, uh, how do we apply it, or, or when we apply it, what do we want it to do? Um, and so the, we're kind of, you can go anywhere you want to go within those questions, but what do you think of as you're directing praxis, either embodied theory or the, what, what you want your work to do in the world? 
and also we don't have to keep going down the line if you if you just want to jump in we'll pass it around yeah. Yeah. We, we were laughing because I, I had a real issue with the word. I didn't know what it was, and, and I had to be told repeatedly, and then I wouldn't remember, and I was really a mess over it. So, <laughs> so um, I just think that my, um, the essential core of what I do as an artist is to tell my people's stories, like everyone on this panel. And, um, and that's, that's what I do. And I do it by listening. And I do it by trying to work with whoever's creation that is to make it as clear as possible. And I do it um, when I'm in the room um, like a painter in that I, um, you know, I did many exercises in, in, in which I try to release the, my power through my solar plexus. And when you paint, you don't think, you, you just you know, move the brush and something creates. And that's really the way that I direct. I sit there and I let ideas come to me and, and then I put them to action. And I you, trust my actors to uh, help me make choices and I pick the choices that I like. Someone said earlier, uh, we had an afternoon session about being prepared. I, I don't really prepare. Uh, I work with my designers. I know what my, my visual is going to be, what the space is going to be. Um, I know what the play is saying and I, I'm making discoveries, but I go in there every day and improvise with the people that are around me because I trust them and something emerges. Uh, and I, I, I'm, uh, you know, I, I have a personal vision, but that vision is collectively done in the room because I believe in the community that I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm bringing their story to, and I believe in the community that I surround myself as, who are artists. Yeah, I think um, the word praxis for me has always been um, a kind of a heady concept. But when I think of it, I think of axis, <laughs> axis, axes, <laughs> um, and access in a way. Um, but I, 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 a few years back, quite a few years back actually, I was at a conference in uh, Toronto, and um, there was a, a professor from the University of the West Indies, his name is Roll, Gib Roll Gibbons, who uh, proposed uh, that there are um, aesthetic values that one can trace in um, African and African diaspora work. And these values are ancestrality, um, communality, and adaptation or affirmation. And so I was really captured by that idea and started, you know, whenever I read a play, um, from anywhere in the diaspora or from Africa, from the continent itself, I would look for these values in the plays and uh, I would often find them. Um, and, uh, and then I started mapping that onto um, what I call the building blocks uh, for making performance in theater, which is body, mind, voice or breath, and spirit. And so I started looking at adaptation or ancestrality from, a, from the perspective of the mind, from the perspective of the body. And, and, and so I, I, I have a geeky chart that I fill out and, and I put questions in there. And the questions change every time I revisit those aesthetic values and the building blocks. Um, and especially within, in relationship to the project I'm working on, so this idea of theory doesn't become heady, but it's also, it's all through my being and, yeah, again, this idea of multi-directionality. Um, yeah, so I think, I, I love to geek out in that way. Um, and, and also to, to figure out how to practice that. How does that work itself into a methodology of creation, a methodology of rehearsal? Um, and a methodology of performance. 
you know, we talk about decolonizing space, and so we also, I think, decolonize theater in general. Uh, I think back that, you know, performance has been in the Middle East for thousands of years, yes. but just when Napoleon shows up and throws a proscenium arch, right. we have to start. <laughs> we have to start standing up in front of an audience, you know, in the, under a proscenium. So what I try to do is I try to go back and think about what was there before Napoleon showed up and, you know, terrorized all the people uh, and stole from them. Uh, but, you know, I think about the Halakha form, I talk about the, the Hakawaiti form, I talk about, I try to study all of these forms in an attempt to kind of get back to basics and think about how can I reapply that now? Because if there is a sort of common spirit that has connected us through the ages, maybe we're still informed by that spirit and can we not get back to that spirit and how, what can it tell us about plays even written in 2019, right? I mean, I think there's something very powerful there. And so that's for me, what I try to do with my practice is I try to think, learn about these different forms, study these different forms, uh, and then in, find ways to really embody them in the plays, whether it's physically, through design elements, through the, the way I direct the play, the staging, all of the above. Um, and, and there's so many deep traditions in the Middle East. I mean, I'm doing a play about a Maronite tradition. I mean, that's a, such a deep, beautiful Christian tradition. I've done plays about ancient Islamic forms and others. So I think that's, that for me is where praxis comes in, is learning as much as I can about this culture and then finding direct ways of re-embodying, re-staging, and re-signifying all of those new works with that ancient knowledge. So um, hearing you say that made me think of one of my influences, um, which is uh, Ngugi Wathiongo. And uh, moving the center, that's what it's all about. It's about realigning and shifting that paradigm. And for us, it's going back to looking at our forms in, you know, from time immemorial, where we had performance and drawing from that. And the other thing from Ngugi is his, you know, statement that when we choose our language, we assume our audience. So when we are writing in Olelo Hawaii, we are doing that for our Olelo Hawaii community. Other folks can come along. <laughs> we want the allies, right? We want everybody to, if everybody could speak Hawaiian, that would be amazing, right? Um, but it is definitely for that primary reason that, you know, the raising of the language and the serving of, of our community. Um, Takirua uh, in Aotearoa, their, their work has also influenced um, our praxis, you know, how we approach things, trying to get out into the community with, the, with our work as well. And then I would even mention Thompson Highway you know, when I read, when I first read Red Sisters, I went, oh, yes, these are the stories we need to be telling, you know, and, and being introduced to, you know, Spider-Woman Theater, that's another thing. When I was, you know, a graduate student, I was introduced to that, uh, that material and the methodology, and that inspired me as well, you know, and, and it also what it did was it validated that we were making the right choices. Yeah, to, to stay in our culture. And then applying, for us, there's four things. There's our mo'olelo, our stories. And story and history, they, you know, there's fantastical things in our stories as well. So we don't have nonfiction and fiction, right? It's all involved, yeah. Um, and then our ku'auho, which is our genealogical connection to this material. And we have our Hana no Eau, which are our various forms of performing arts, and then Olalo Hawaii. Those four things are our pillars. They're our kukulu of everything that we do. And when we have those four, we have a strong story to tell. Mahalo. trained as an actor. So as I direct these pieces, um, many times I'll get stuck and I won't know what to do. And then I go and stand on that spot that the actor's standing on. And suddenly I know, because that, that activates all my stuff. Um, uh, 
so much has come out of just listening to you people, how, how wise they are and what we can all take. One of the things, the yokes we all struggle under is that post-colonial legacy that separated us and diced us up. And, and you see, as long as you, you're, you're carrying that around, and I'm not saying I'm free of it, uh, like Zaki said, uh, that paint is harder to remove than we thought. But um, uh, you believe that this experience is unique to you, and so you never get the, the strength and solidarity of dealing with other people because you think it's just you. Well, it's the same process in culture after culture after cultures have been eaten up and so forth. Um, so that, that, that's first. There's just so, so much to learn. Um, inside of this literature, I do plays. Uh, I'd, I'd be scared to go where you go. <laughs> but, uh, uh, <laughs> I, you know, with well-made plays a lot. And you can't read this work. You can't come in contact with this literature without being changed by it. Uh, not only the craft that it takes to put the piece up and, you know, knowing all how to do that. Let's talk about the content of, of what they're saying. I see in the plays that I read a, a conduct of life, a way of moving through the world rules for survival, cautionary tales. Um, th these, are, these are ways of passing information on and making them live. Sometimes it's awakening my community. Many times, uh, uh, we're in Minnesota, and in Minnesota, I think the last census, uh, we won't get into the census, and we are getting ready to go out there trying to do there. But, um, there's only 5% of Minnesota is African American. And, and that's, you know, that's not a, a lot. And you break that down into how many African Americans go to theater. Yeah. Right? So you, got, you might not have a lot of people in some of your performances. It'll surprise you. The point being, though, is that um, we still, well, I used to get in an argument with August Wilson. He was one of our company members. And August used to say that culture is something that you put in your pocket and you can take it anywhere you want. It goes with you. I said, no, man, culture is in the ground. It's in the dirt. It's, that's where my grandfather was. And, you know, all, these are arguments that, that we can go on about. But I know that the practice of bringing these things to life changes you. It changes who you are. It changes the way you think. I'm looking at Sharon back there. You see in her, I, I'm never the same since we did that play. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, what was the name of the play? Conflama. Yes, Conflama. Yeah. I'll yeah. never forget that little girl. You know? And, and those things, that's the way we uh, we move ourselves, the way we commune, um, the way we give ourselves the dignity that the world may not. We can be we can be in control of that in those places, and it's up to us to do that. And you got to be careful because there's so much misinformation about all y'all. Till you be going to put something up, and you think you're being you know wow and you. Built another stereotype. So you do have to study. It's not good enough to put the book under the pillow and sleep on it. You know, you, you, the, I always say the people that I portray, these black folks, are tricky. I've been studying them for 70 years, and I'm telling you, they're tricky. So, you know, you really have to study it. And if you do that, and if you love, learn to love, who you are and what it is you do, 
these people will open my flowers for you. They will, they'll become something that you, you can stand there and just watch it happen. But, but you do have to have that, that investment, that love, and that study, that hard, hard study that, that teaches me about Fort Sill. <laughs> or, you know, those kinds of things. You have to study it. You have to learn it. But those are the sort of the rules that, that I use in creating the work. And, and I, I'm not afraid to, to think about what my grandmother would think about what it is I'm doing. You know, if, if she if she said, boy, what? What is wrong with you? <laughs> and if I can hear that, then I know I'm not doing right. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds trite, but it works for me. Thank you. I was supposed to be keeping some kind of time, and I just got so into the conversation, I was like, that just went out the window because all of this is so rich and so many important things to talk about uh and, and so we'll just keep the conversation flowing and um i you know we just discovered uh in our in our lunch meeting before the panel that i i'm also a student of ngugi Wathiongo. i mean literally i was his student and so um to find that somebody that I was drawn to study with, a, a playwright from Kenya, influenced this movement in Hawaii, right? In the way that Augusta Ball's work in Brazil influenced, I don't know how many theater practitioners around the world, uh, in the way that hip hop theater, it, you know, in the way that hip hop is the voice of an activist movement in Palestine, in the way that, um, you know, the great John O'Neill, who we just lost, who just passed away, and his practice of story circles and coming from the civil rights movement has also influenced so many artists practicing in the United States who might not even know that they're doing his work, but they're doing it, right? Um, so there's a certain way, uh, I, you know, I, um, I also studied with Mae Joseph, who always said, you know, globalization started in the 1300s. I don't know what y'all think is new about this, right? <laughs> in some ways, we have always been doing this, right? Theater has always been oral tradition, and we have always been exchanging and learning from each other. Um, and yet, here we are, in this moment in 2019 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, in this institute where we have brought together this extremely intentionally diverse group of artists to see what we can learn from each other. And so we've already talked about solidarity, we've already talked about intercultural uh, connection. And even though it's like core to what we do, it's also hard. You know, it's also full of challenges. It's full of um, moments that don't always go so well and uh, where we have to do that hard learning, yeah? And so uh, that's another thing that we were talking about as we were preparing for this is um, how do we work across contexts, what across cultures, across um, uh, collaborating across context when maybe we have so much learning still to do about each other's histories and struggles. And, and what are we learning in this time together about how to do that better? Um, you know, I, I, I started, yeah, we, at the end of our conversation at lunch, I said, God, you know, I think I, I, I need I need um, I need therapy <laughs> uh, because because you know everyone says um, you know the, about the question of how do you use your power and and uh, that that's a big question for me um, you know you, you you reach a certain point in your career in which you have cachet or you have equity and and I don't know how to spend it you know. Uh, because because so few ahead have had this opportunity, right? 
And, and one of the ways in which we can at least help each other is to um, elevate each other, yeah. right? And, um, and to talk about each other, lift up each other, yeah. yes. right? Across cultural barriers that once were, because now we don't we don't have those anymore. Let's 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 envision us not having them, right? And that we bring each other up whenever we can, and that that's definitely one way to lift. I could go on. <laughs> there was a. I, I live in contradiction as I. Let me say, I know all of you do too. Little contradiction. So I worked at this regional theater, which is an amazing theater, done a lot of great work, and um, I always felt like an outsider, right? But I think I practiced that. I think really in the end, I wanted to be an outsider. And I would push and I would pull and I would argue and I would challenge the status quo because kind of that's what I was. You know, that's the community I came from, and that's what we did. And I never said, oh, I belong here. I never said that. So 25 years later, I'm saying at my, retire my retirement, which is, I never uttered that word. I don't know where they got that. <laughs> Rewire, maybe, but never retire. And, uh, right, right? And so, um, and so I said, you know, I felt like an outsider for nearly 25 years. That's weird. But... I uh, claim that I'm an American artist. Mm -hmm. I claim that. I am a US artist. And if, if, if you won't move over, you know, for my butt to sit down in this chair, I will push you over. <laughs> because I do think that we have to claim our space. And even now, I am trying to challenge form. I, hey, you know, I love the well-made play, and if Lou Bellamy is going to be directing a well-made play, I'm going to go see it. Mm -hmm. If Lou, I may not like Shakespeare, but if Lou Bellamy's going to play King Lear, I'm there, yeah. right? Yes. But I don't, I don't need to to, to do that work. I, I don't need to because I don't love that work. I'm not passionate about that work. So I'm trying to figure out how to challenge our, our forms. So I, I you know, I, I've, and many people in ensembles have been doing this, but I, I say, hey, there's three of us creating a play. You're the, set, you're the production designer, I'm the direction designer, and, and she's the script designer. And we're gonna make a work together. And I pitched this concept with a story and, and all to a major theater. And we went back and forth as to how we could make this work within their form. They're, they're a university-based repertory company. And it was interesting that they took it on. So all I'm saying is that there is power in challenge. And when you claim I'm an American artist and make room for me, it's interesting what happens. It is. Uh, and, and I would just like to, to put the call out there for us to realize that American artists can mean so many things. And, yes, and yes, I, I I'm a product of public schools, yes. and frankly, I didn't know there was anybody but a Shakespeare or a Hawthorne or a Milton. Or I mean, it was shocking that that we are not taught our history in this country, and it's shocking and it's wrong. Yes. And we need to we need to reteach the history. Mm -hmm. yes. There's Latinx history that needs to be taught, and I know that's a fraught term, but I know. <laughs> um, there's Asian American history, African American history, Arab American history. There is uh, Native American, American history. You you name it. Yeah, call it out. I'm, Native there American. you go. Native First Peoples. That's right. Amen. That's right. Native American. Yeah. I, I grew up in New Mexico. Did I read a single work by a Native American writer? And there were plenty. And there were plenty. 
and there are plenty. So, so this is this is a problem. And so, I would just like to call all of you as artists to also become activists in that way, yeah. to change the landscape of what is being read in our schools, yeah. so our young people can grow up knowing that you can be a hyphenated artist. You're still an American artist, but you can be hyphenated and be proud of your particular community while still honoring other communities. And that's something I feel is such a detriment in our society. There's a quote that I love um, from um, Amokar uh, Cabral um, that is, uh, if I remember it, ma'am, let's see. Um, Without underestimating the contributions from the oppressor's culture, we must uphold and uplift the traditions from our root cultures. And I, I, I butchered the exact quote, but it's about drawing from our root cultures and valuing that in a way and equally with what we've been taught to value in terms of uh, yeah. mainstream culture. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. So uh, we are um, taking some questions from the folks who are live, and while they're getting passed over my way, um, we will. Uh, oh, okay. Hi. Hi, Diana. Say hi to the camera and the people. <laughs> We have, we have about 20 minutes to keep talking and, and to take some of these questions. Um, and I also just want to say, uh, just because it had been kind of recently, and I have to. So uh, it is interesting to me how um, folks of color get hyphenated and, uh, and uh, white folks get normalized, right? Yeah. So I am uh, just offering that we develop the practice of saying European American or Euro American when that's what we mean. Um, yeah, Euro American because um, uh, it, 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 there shouldn't be this kind of normalization of language, right? Um, we are we are all hyphenated and uh, Native American folks shouldn't be hyphenated at all because that's ridiculous. <laughs> and uh, to also remember that when we say American, we mean all of the Americans. Yeah, and that right. this is just that's a place right. that had the audacity to call itself the that's United right. States that's of America. Right. Um, so, okay, question number one, very exciting. Um, <laughs> Is hope a relationship um, between healing and your work? And if so, can you talk about how you have experienced it? Is hope the relationship between healing and your work? And can you talk about how you have experienced that? Oh, yes. Oh. Is there a relationship? Oh, is there a relationship? Is there a relationship, much more general, is there a relationship between healing and your work and how have you experienced that? Although I just love, I kind of like the quite hope question as well. So feel free to answer any of them. I'm going to pass it to Heidi first. Um, Coco, please. Um, yeah, I think there's a coming. Um, I'm not sure if this is how you had intended, Ron, but I'm going to I'm going to answer anyway because this came to my mind. Coming from a people, a community in which our language was banned in 1896 and not reinstated until nearly a century later, performing in our language is healing. Yes. It is, it is a, political, a political move, right? That's part of our consciousness and my dear grandma has passed, but when she heard her mo'opuna, her grandchildren, my children, speaking in the language, and I saw her crying, every sacrifice I had ever made to make sure my children was raised knowing their language, knowing their identity, and having a firm foundation on what it means to be Kanaka Maoli, that's all I needed. That is all I needed. Yeah, I would say uh, that 
the arrivals work is also um, healing work in, in the sense that um, many of the people that come to the work don't have their root culture. They don't know, including myself. I don't know, I don't have it really um, in, in, a hard, in a hard kind of documented way where my people come from. So what do I work from? I have to work from what is in my body, what travels through my body, um, and that is healing. And the people that I work with, it's, it's most definitely healing. It's healing in the practice, it's healing in, in um, their lives just because they've reported it uh, to me. And, um, and I think it's healing in the community as well. I, I think the way I could describe it for you, what happens when you free up the stuff that we're talking about, when you engage it, it's actors that, that come to work with me and in our theater and on the literature that we work on, it, it's rather like they're wearing tight shoes. <laughs> do you know what I mean? They're, they're in there and now they've got all the craft, they can do all the stuff. You ask them to do something and often they will show you the pain of it because that's what they've been asked for in many, many other yeah. circumstances to give. I will ask them, well, I know it hurts, yeah, but what you're gonna do? Let's, let me see you think about it. And it's as though you take off those tight shoes and those feet just start to breathe and things begin to, to happen in, in, in a different kind of way. to describe it, but it feeds itself, and, and the, the more of it you do, the, the more happens. Um, and I found it to be so, we, we did, when the National Endowment uh, for Theater sponsored a national tour in the United States, they sponsored a tour that the Guthrie did of Othello. I know one of our company members played with Ella. But, um, so we, at the same time, toured the first Native American play to tour the United States. We weren't funded. And we found the money to play by Bill the Yellow Road, called Grandchildren of the Buffalo Soldiers. And we toured this piece in, at reservations and went where people are Many of them had never seen the drum on stage. Or it was, I, well, I can't explain it. I, I, I try, but that, that way that his play and art allowed us to approach an, an, another culture and watch the way those wounds are opened and healed and not left gaping but spoken about and so forth. It was, it was truly miraculous, I don't know. Art, we, art does something we don't, we don't get all of, you know? Uh -huh. you, you can, we can intellectualize it, but something else happens, you know? And oh my, I'm not done. <laughs> Um, I want to say something on this healing question, kind of connected to what Malik said earlier, um, which is um, in some of my own work, I actually, I actually still love a good tragedy. <laughs> um, you know, and it doesn't have to be a Shakespearean one, but I, can, I was drawn to theater because of drama first, right? And and then I think about why is that and why. Uh, do I need that space? And when I when I think about my own work, sometimes I think that um, sometimes we need places to mourn, yes. to publicly mourn together, because we're not allowed to, or we're not safe to, right, in the political context that we live in right now. 
Like, can you imagine in the United States if a bunch of Arabs just got together and decided to wail in the street? No, I don't, I don't think we'd feel very safe doing that. <laughs> right, but we can in theater, we can mourn. And, and then we can also laugh and dance and play music. And, but if we, don't, um, if we don't have that space, we can't heal, right? Um, and so in a way that, that leads to this interesting, one of the next question is an interesting question about strong and powerful characters and physical action on stage. And the question is, um, when we're representing our own communities, what does that look like? A quote unquote strong or powerful character or strong or powerful physical action? Um, because we're so often um, told what not to do. And as directors, um, what, do you, what do you love to do or what do you wanna be sure that um, actors always do in your in your pieces, and I'm, I may be interpreting this a little bit wrong, but yeah. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's, that's what okay. we talk about. Like, we want to. Oh, you're not on. You're not on. Oh, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> I, uh, anybody want to answer yeah. that, and we can have further. Yeah. Well, I, I think the most powerful thing an actor can do on stage is think. Seriously, I mean, Andy Warhol proved that with that camera. You know, he just put it on. We are innately interesting because we're human, you know? Mm -hmm. So that thinking is a place where I always want to leave space for, for an actor to perform. There's that, that instant where a choice is made. And that's, that's the crux of theater for me. That's what makes it live. It isn't just a stimulus response. There's a choice to be made, and that's the stuff of it. I mean, we are creating a new canon for the United States, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's up to us to create those powerful characters that we envision us to be. And that's our responsibility. We don't need to go back to that well-made play. If you want to, go for it. But you don't need to. We need to go and make our own versions of well-made plays or our own ensemble driven work. And I think that that's really what the future is, um, is to contribute to, to, to what we're putting on and, and, and uh, on, the sta on, our sta on our American stages, on our US stages in particular. And then that work will go out into the world, right? And so I think that's our responsibility. Um, Dina. <laughs> So here's another question um, uh, to Lou and Halia Pua, and anybody can answer as well. Um, how do those of us who are uh, coming up and who are starting to hear that question, why are you still here, grapple with the economic questions of, and of opportunity versus community? That's the way it was written. Opportunity versus community. Or capitalization, uh, capitalized and colonized um, especially when you have multiple marginalized identities and there's so and, and opportunities are limited in so many ways by the by the challenges of inequity in our field. What do you say to those folks coming up? That, that's an eternal question and it calls at least from where I found I'm lucky I, I found in the theater and started finding a way to make a living being paid for something that I do free. So I'm, I, I, it's a bird nest on the ground, my mm -hmm. grandmother used to say. But I think it calls for some sort of schizoid existence. And, and it's nothing that you don't know how to do because you're surviving in this, in this world in the United States. You already know how to do it. You should, who do I know? But you, I, I think you want to try to keep your art as sacred as you can for as long as you can. It's very true. Yes. I'm not yes. saying you're going to win. 
<laughs> because you're going to go sell Cheerios or something for somebody, you know, for example, or, or you'll be prostituted and you don't even know it, you know. But you should try to, try to keep that as pure for as long as you possibly can. You're in a wonderful spot at the age you're in. You should, you should hold on to it for as long as you can. I was thinking about this idea we talked about when we were um, at lunch together about this idea of stealing back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking of this idea of digging in deeper. We dig in deeper, as you say, you know, um, uh, dig in deeper and train, learn your own traditions, learn theirs, and steal them. Steal back what was stolen from us and repurpose it. Re Find it in your own body so that you can um, just more confidently, once the opportunity comes, you are there. And you more confidently can step into those feet that uh, Lou talked about. Um, perhaps I'll add, uh, to me, at a young age, um, there's still a lot of learning to be done, and there's still a lot of uh, exploring that needs to be done. Once you explore and once you decide, or once you're able to kind of listen to the path that you're meant to be on, um, then you can step forward, I think, and realize that if you stay home, right, your community's got you, and they will hold you accountable for the work that you're doing. Now, if you want to be that fancy expert, right, and go 500 miles away, <laughs> uh, that a professor once told me, what's an expert? Uh, it's any, I'm going to say it, any asshole that's 500 miles away from their home, they're an expert, <laughs> right? Because nobody can check them on what they're saying, right? So if you choose that path, right, you, maybe that's the path for you. Uh, no judgment, no judgment. No. <laughs> um, I, think, I, I, I think staying home has benefits. And if you stay home, you might have to diversify. I'm very grateful to have the teaching gig that I have, you know, to be, and I call it a gig, so that, that's probably demeaning, but to be a professor, it, it's a gig. Right? You know, we perform in front of the class every day. <laughs> um, but I, I think being able to, I feel like I have a dream job. Being able to teach and grow new artists and new voices, nurture new voices, and then still through our theater company be doing the important work for the community, um, it's, a, it's, it's a dream scenario. Um, so I think find what you love and then allow yourself to recognize what we call ho'elona or the signs. Recognize those signs of where you're supposed to be and what your purpose, your function, um, and your kuleana or responsibility is. Uh -huh. um, Joseph Campbell said the minute you take somebody else's path, it's not your path. So just forge your own path. And if that means staying where you are and digging deep into your community, do that thing. Because that's probably gonna be the source of your power. I mean, the more you chase down somebody else's life, the less you're probably going to find it. That's, that's what I've noticed in my few years here. You know, the other thing is we don't recognize our own power enough. And, and you, you, you would understand this, what uh, August uh, Wilson says, I'm standing in my grandfather's shoes. In other words, you know, his grandfather walked as far as he could and he's put those shoes on. That's what you bring with you. You've got stuff, but we don't always recognize that, that we have it. We just don't. And it's our job as people who are supposedly in the know to let you know all you got, the fire you got, before you go to some finishing school and they take it away from you. You know, you, you get in there and they say, cross over there and don't hold your crotch like 
that? Why you gotta walk like that? You know, those kinds of things. You have to understand the power of it. Mm -hmm. um, we are winding down on time. We have about three minutes left, at least for the live stream conversation, although the conversation here will definitely continue at the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation. We didn't fully get to the last question, although it was very connected to what you all just said about um, advice for uh, how to um, stay true to yourself in doing the work and uh, whether you're working with, you get an opportunity that takes you off your path or even uh, you're working with a director or a collaborator or a producer that is trying to push the work in a direction that doesn't feel true. And I, what we hear you all saying is stay true. Stay true to who you are, stay true to your past, stay true to the, the core of the work, the roots of the work, and, uh, and uh, hang on to that as long as you can. Thank you, Lou Bellamy, for that. Yeah. Um, and so if folks at home uh, or you know, on, on, uh, online want to continue to follow uh, what we're doing here at the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation, uh, you can follow us uh, on the Pangea uh, website or social media or Art to Action um, social media. We have hashtags, um, hashtag Directing Institute, which always amazes me that nobody claimed that hashtag before we do. Amazing, so yes, that's us, Directing Institute. And uh, also, uh, NIDEC 2019, uh, or Attraction Art Pan GWT. So we hope you'll stay in the conversation and stay in the journey with us um, online. And I'm just gonna pass the mic uh, one more time for any last, I mean, and really a word or two. Like, just a word or two, because we got li literally two minutes. Uh, on the live stream, so just any last thought or blessing or wish or anything. <laughs> just gratitude, that's all. Yeah. Really, gratitude. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm grateful to be among my tribe here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love your generosity with time. Thank you. Mahalo yeah. Anui. Thank you all. Thank you, Lucas.